Um, Secretary to Cabinet, uh, Ms. Wenjiao, uh, the academics and students seated, um, and perhaps I should also mention that our chief guest has not come alone, she's come with members from our office. Um, good morning. Are you looking happy? For those I teach personal and social skills, how are you feeling? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Secretary to Cabinet, um, I'm transitioning from constitutional law to, to other things that are strange. For example, emotional intelligence. I teach them such things. Yeah, emotions, how to control them. Feelings, how to apply them at work. So I have a whole course that I teach called personal and social skills for lawyers because lawyers need to be in charge if they are, they are persons. So one of the questions we ask those I teach is, how are you feeling? I, I, I still can't get the answer. How are you feeling? Glad, yes. So in our class, uh, we have learned that there are four main emotions, primary emotions, others follow from there. And then some people argue that you could add two others. So among the core emotions are glad, sad, Yeah? Mad? Scared? Surprised? And? Disgusted. Um, so how are you feeling? Glad, thank you. That's what I thought we should say. I'm also feeling very glad. And the reason for that is because of this historic moment that is represented by the presence of the Secretary to Cabinet in this institution of learning. It is a very, very rare happening, uh, perhaps I should mention, which is why I'm exceedingly glad. We shall look for the other emotions that accompany this later, but for now, I think it suffices to say that. Excited, you? jubilated, happy, you? so, so, so happy because of the reasons I'm going to tell you. Number one, that we have been undergoing reforms at the national level since 2010, uh, since the establishment of the 2010 constitution. And part of those reforms have been at cabinet level. Um, this is the second government, um, of course, third election, but second government, bringing in a second president under the new constitution properly, that is Honorable William Ruto. And um, we are all just learning about the workings of that cabinet system. One of the main reforms was to migrate from what some people thought was parliamentary, but a mixture of systems to something that could be very close to a presidential system, if the US system is the typical case. Um, part of that also has come with um, uh, moving from politicians or members of parliament um, to cabinet secretaries. You could have some politicians among them, but in this new role, they are not sitting members of parliament. They are separate from the entity called parliament. And so we have a purely separated executive, secured executive, to perform its own unique role as an executive of state. So that's a key reform. The second area has been um, what Ms. Wanjiao has discussed with me earlier, which is to separate office, two offices that were merged earlier. And the two offices were uh, the head of public service would also be the secretary to cabinet. And that has come with a lot of exciting things. Um, just talking to Ms. Wanjiao earlier today, because we had a meeting with the vice chancellor as well, and also in my office, it came out quite clearly that there was a lot of wisdom in that reform. Because one, you give the cabinet office special status and special function. And because of that, they can concentrate on professionalizing the operations of cabinet. Okay. Second, then you liberate the head of public service to run the public service professionally. And since all these reforms, um, we haven't had, at least not to my knowledge, a public lecture on the works of, workings of cabinet anywhere in this republic from an insider. So that makes me a very, very excited person. So glad that we shall look for the synonyms later. I'll be asking um, if she's here, Anne, 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 Anne to, to give me the <laughs> the list later when we, when we are done so that we can read the other 
emotions that revolve around GLAD just for that reason alone. We're going to be the first, first group of learners to hear from the horse's mouth how the new system works. Is that something to be happy about? Thank you. Secondly, if you grew up when I grew up, then you know that there was always a separation of spheres. There was a sphere of students, now, yeah, uh, not very important people, and the high and mighty who held senior positions in government, and the two spheres did not interact. In fact, when you heard from those levels, you were being sent home. If you went to school, when I went to school, you know what I mean. Any time a circular could come from the Ministry of Education to the Vice Chancellor, and you are home. The next thing you see is policemen armed with all the kind of things they usually armed with. That was our interaction with the state. And we thank God that for the last few years, we have begun to see that that's, those two spheres have been merging. For us lawyers, since the um, appointment of uh, Professor William Tunga to the Office of Chief, Chief Justice, we've seen increasingly that judges have been free to come to the universities and learn with us and teach us and challenge us and show the way to us. And some have even adopted us as mentors. That is something we only heard of in campus. I remember that throughout my four years in campus, only two judges visited the school after a lot of hard work on our end. In one case, I was the student leader, a lot of hard work to get them to school. Um, this year alone, 40 judges have been to Kabarak Law School. 40 judges. Thank you. Thank you for clapping and for a whole week. On my desk right now is an invitation from the judiciary to actually a request for us to give an indication of which date we want to host a judge from the High Court before the semester closes. So, thank you. So there are a number of reforms going on at the government level and the spheres are bridging the gap so quickly. So while reforms have happened at the judicial level, we haven't seen similar reforms in the other arms of government. For example, I always looked forward to the day when I was younger, um, the day when cabinet secretaries, those days we call them ministers, would come to the university and debate sessional papers with us. Why don't they come and say, this is session of paper number this on the education system of the republic, whatever you call it. Let's debate it, let's thrash it out in these uh, lecture halls or auditoriums, and then they can become policy much later, but with our input. I always thought it is possible, but many times I also thought I was dreaming. But this day is historic in that sense, uh, that for the first time in my life in the university, I have seen a member of cabinet okay, come to the university very happily to explain how she does her operations, what they do, how they do it, and why. That is something that will go down history books. I think on that point we should clap for our chief guest for making that gesture. Finally, I'm happy because even though we had invited our chief guest and speaker, even though she had confirmed one of my biggest worry and concern was she could just get a phone call from the president and he says, we need you urgently back in Nairobi. <laughs> and that will be the end of it. You have to reschedule, perhaps, if you are lucky. And I kept praying God that this day comes to pass and I'm so excited, going back to GLAD, um, that uh, our chief guest made it today and she's ready to give the presentation. Thanks be to God for that. Finally, just a comment on our method of uh, andragogy at the university. I used to say pedagogy, but I was told that pedagogy applies to children, then andragogy applies to the mature students like yourselves. There are no children here, to the best of my knowledge. There's a quote that I think we discussed in our first year class that is usually ascribed to Baron de Montesquieu. Uh, where he said that there are three kinds of education, you remember? The first education is at the family level. The second is in schools. Then the third is education that life itself gives. Character development. The university of life, isn't it? Um, and he said, the problem with these three educations is that they don't marry. 
what the family tells you doesn't work in school or the school tells you doesn't work in life. Isn't it? So you are released to the world to figure out. In fact, you're told to find your own levels. Send you. So the exciting thing about our approach to education in Kabarak is that we actually try to merge all these educations. So instead of letting you find your level, because one day, I'm sure because she's come here, in spiritual times we say, upako. If you go to my church, you would know what that means. I'm a letter upako or CS. <laughs> and, and, and because she's brought that upako, one day you'll find yourself in a cabinet space. Amen. Thank you. And you don't know what to do. But luckily for us, you will not be very much lost because you'll have heard from the best of them all. And that is the last reason I thought I should discuss with you. So thank you very much, um, Chief Guest, for coming here. And uh, be free and willing to give us a lecture on something no one else has talked about, just because of that reason I've mentioned. Finally, um, I will be inviting our guests to come and take this platform and speak to us. And I'll also be inviting you to ask questions when that is um, asked of you. And then we can call it a day, um, two, two or so hours later. Um, our chief guest requires no introduction. I think it is already written there. And I like this tradition of the United States, this particular one. don't like many things from there, but this particular one. Their president has no introduction. Just say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, isn't it? That's how you do it. Anytime you find that they have to read so many things, you're not that important. And that's why I had problems with the psalm. Because when I say Moses, you know who that is. Daniel, they have one name. They require no introduction. And that's the same to our guest. She actually requires no introduction. She's secretary to cabinet. And so I'll be inviting her to this platform. But before that, just also to tell her um, that uh, you'll be sp she'll be speaking to a distinguished group of students. I think I've told you this, and to get this from me is very rare because I'm very critical. Um, uh, Secretary to Cabinet, this is the most exceptional group of students I've ever taught in my two decades at university level. Thank you. Some didn't clap. Maybe they don't believe it. The ones behind, did you clap? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have not taught a group of students like this. Um, in fact, I never thought it would happen in my lifetime. Anywhere outside Oxford or Harvard. I never thought I would see it with my eyes or with my senses. And this is how they're special. Um, it, among us are people who have written articles. Serious articles in journals, in reputable blogs, in magazines, and they're writing more. Just seated here, right here. Among us are also people who um, have won international moot court competitions. They have gone to Africa, they have gone to Europe, they have gone to other parts of the world and returned trophies of different kinds. Those are the kind of people we are going to address. Thank you. Among us are people who have won debates regionally, globally. Among us are people who have made innovations and have presented on them at global platforms. Should I continue? Yeah, I could go on and on, but uh, you, you are going to speak to a very distinguished group of students, not the kind that you could have seen somewhere throwing stones. They actually don't know how stones look like. So <laughs> yeah, we also have leaders here. Um, we have distinguished leaders, actually honorable leaders from Kabarak University Law Students Association. I think they'll have an opportunity to maybe give opening remarks, and so forth and so on. And then you're also going to speak to distinguished members of faculty. I think those ones can stand. If you could stand, the ones that are here. Mr. Sam Gure is there, but we begin here with the Associate Dean. Yeah, Associate Dean is there. We introduced to you much earlier, Mr. Sam Gure, Mr. Tomolo, and Ms. Mungai. And some of them will be following online. Um, so it's going to be a very good fusion of a very great um, state officer and very, very distinguished academics of Kabarak University Law Schools. So, with those remarks, uh, Secretary to Cabinet, feel free to come and address your audience. 
Kitu mkaribisha ya? Sindia? Thank you. Thank you. Karibu. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. You know, as I came up here, the feeling that caught me was scared. <laughs> it looks so many people. But then, overwhelmingly, it is a feeling of gladness. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here. I've passed outside the gate in the past, but I had just never come in. What a beautiful place. It's really, 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 very, very beautiful. And I'm happy to be with you today to come and have this conversation. But uh, before I start, um, I just thought to myself, hearing that you're first year, second semester, right? Most, most of the students? Who are first year, first semester? Oh. <laughs> I think that's such a special, it's such a special place to be, first year, first semester. And, uh, you know, thinking um, to myself, about myself as a first year, first semester student, um, not knowing much, you know, about a constitution. Um, obviously, you can tell that I went to school before your dean. He got to listen to judges lecturing them during our time judges did not come to the university. I was at the university in the beginning of the multi-party democracy, so that was at a time of a lot of uh, tension. Those kind of uh, conversations really just did not happen. So the story about the of the constitution and discussions around that were very low, very moot, and uh, I probably have been at the back there you know, just listening at the back and wondering about this constitution. It sounds so difficult. And I remember numerous conversations around the constitution, constitutionalism, the spirit of laws, in French called l'esprit de loi, and wondering, okay, what's that? So it's such uh, a distinguished honor to come back and have those conversations and uh, within the focus of the workings of the cabinet where I currently work inside the executive office of the president. What have I been trying to do? I've been trying to demonstrate that life is lived forward but it's understood backward. This is why I started that I'd probably have been back there and then come slowly, slowly to the front and I'm not suggesting that those who sit at the back are not paying attention, no. I was just the kind of student who needed to sit at the front so that I pay attention. Because when I sit at the back, I will easily be taken over by other uh, preoccupations. But this African proverb, I think, is very profound for us as individuals, for us as a university, for us as a community, and even as a country. Because we continue to live forward, when you look at the preamble of the Constitution, very, very, very aspirational indeed. Very aspirational, actually profound. But you only understand things backwards because that's when you try and connect the dots. So as we sit here, I do recognize some of you are in law school, others are doing uh, other disciplines. But uh, I invite us to reflect and ask, as I try to live my life forward, what should this life look, look like for me as an individual, for my community, for the family I will have, the country that I, that I will live in? I also invite us to elevate highly, to elevate highly, because when I was in first year, second semester, I don't think I ever imagined I would ever do the kind of job I do. But I also come now to say that these are the possibilities and this is why I invite us to elevate highly. Among you will be politicians at the various levels. You know, now we have them in the national, we have them in the county. But among you will be 
politicians, in the mainstream politicians. Among you will be people in industry, you know, industry captains, experts, analysts, in all these kind of things, not just for Kenya, for the world, right? Among you will be people in academia like where we are today. Some women will come and take his job and say, you know, I was taught by, you know, and they will be now standing here, you know, elaborating on new theories and how the law has evolved and stretched. You know, I didn't know that some things can happen until one time I was speaking to a young law student about what's this case about the snail that was in the dark glass don't know he give us a Stevenson and I was telling her something then she looked at me then she told me but auntie the 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 house of lords of, of overturned that law last year I, I had never imagined that those things can happen in my lifetime because you see when you study these things they look fixed so among you will be academia who will begin to expose new emerging areas of the law because actually have we seen everything yet no you will be there. Among you will be others in civil society, pushing for creative tension, raising questions where nobody has dared to ask, and demanding accountability. This is the kind of composition that we have here. So I do recognize that even as we have this conversation, it's a conversation among leaders. And please see it that way and see it that way for real because then it causes you to really contemplate the conversations that are hard, even as we discuss the story around the evolutions of cabinet. Is cabinet a Kenyan concept? Oh, by the way, I like to interact and ask questions, so don't feel pressure. I mean no pressure. It's just that I like when I hear feedback, then I know I'm going in the right direction. So the evolution of cabinets. You see that picture there? What do you see? Egg, lava, pupa. Ah, your students are. Huh? <laughs> that is the perfect picture of evolution of cabinets. Cabinets are not unique to any particular system. Actually, we had what you would call even cabinets in our local communities. Like which ones do we know? Sorry? I had it. I knew that was going to be the first one. <laughs> Turin -cheke. <laughs> then Turin -cheke. Those are samples of cabinet. Or what we call in other places, Ile Chama Ama Keama. Isn't it? Those were kind of cabinets. And I believe many, many communities did have these kind of um, uh, gatherings or mechanisms. There's one thing that typifies these kind of mechanisms, cabinets. Tell me about them, if you were to describe them. Can I start? One is, they are serious. Ama and Jorin Cheke is a, a walk in the park. They are serious, isn't it? Tell me something else. Feel free. You know, maybe when I retire, I'll come here to teach, so. <laughs> Another character is that to be a member of a cabinet is a space of privilege. They, you just don't land on the person in the street and pick them. Whether it is in that Churin Cheke, the Chama, the cabinet of the Republic of Kenya, the various cabinets that sit all over the world, it's a space of high privilege, meaning it is also a space of high responsibility, right? I think we agreed on that. The world a long time ago was definitely much simpler than the world we are living in today. And uh, even then, in those age old, this is when you'd hear a king, an emperor sits with his advisors to discuss and deliberate, how are we going to rule this land? Where are we headed? In the formal history, this dates to 17th, around 17th century in England, the kings of Great Britain, they started appointing small committees to give them advice because the Privy Council was unwieldy. I'm sure those in the law school, you've seen decisions made by the Privy Council, right? Privy Council, House of Lords. They were becoming so many. 
Can you, can all of you this side sit and coherently advise me on something in two minutes? It's impossible. So, because of that, it became difficult to contemplate issues in an efficient manner, in an effective manner. And so, what happened is that uh, the kings started saying, can I get you in red, you so-and-so, 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 to meet me privately and advise me on a certain issue. What are some of the issues you can think of that perhaps a king at that time would have needed guidance on? War. War. Because those were times of a lot of dynamic movements and exchanges, wars and controversy. Something else could have been during times of disease. Remember the plagues? You know, we don't know what's going on. People are just dying. I need people to advise me because we need to survive. Another thing I can imagine that would have invited a call for private advice. Can you imagine if there was shortage of food? Meaning the kingdom is under threat and we cannot survive. Or the water, the waterways have been poisoned. Because those were, that's how war played out in those days. So the name cabinet actually evolved from the cabinet as you know it, Ile Kabati. Because these were small groups, very private. They used to meet in very small rooms. That's where the name came from. And uh, this is where they would meet. The, this really involved that those who are selected from among the many to bring the best of their knowledge, their expertise, their wisdom, their life experience, to bear on the issue that the king wanted guidance on. So let's move forward to the United States, which in a sense also was looking to the kingdom of Great Britain with the history of uh, migration and all that. There is no constitutional provision for a cabinet. And indeed, well, the U.S. got independence in 17, 17, 76. You notice that the emergence started in 1789, meaning for that uh, intermission in the early years, it means that the president used to sit and decide on his own, pretty much. There was no formal structure on how to do this. And um, a time came when he needed to engage the heads of departments as regular advisors because of the realization. Isn't it? I need, I need help. Help me. Guide me. And indeed, when I read around this issue, uh, it started with George Washington. And the first time when he formally requested for formal help was in time of war. Because you can imagine, time is short, threat is high, you don't know who are your enemies, who are your allies, yet you must stand to uphold and protect your people. All that on the head of one person. So he requested for help. And he went to the Senate. And when he went to the Senate, the conversations would be held. But at some point, he realized that the efficiency once more. Remember England and the Privy Council? Same issue. And uh, he realized that actually, I need more people who are more dedicated to this particular issue to guide me, to support me. And he went back to Senate. And a conversation was to be had where a mechanism, which is what we call the cabinet, would be created. And guess what happened? On the day that he went, it was summer, it was hot, the windows were opened, and uh, there was a lot of noise outside. You know, during summer, there's a lot of activity. So as the speech was being read, it was getting drowned by the noise from outside. So people pleaded and said, close the windows. We need to hear the speech. So the speech was redone again. And after the speech being redone and everything, one gentleman stood up, a senator, and said, 
I propose we create a committee to look into this issue. Imagine after hours and hours of lobbying, canvassing, talking to the issue, then you ask us to set a committee. This so annoyed George Washington, he said he would never come back to Senate again. He was done. Because you can imagine when you have to discuss and come out with some resolute discussion on something, you have to deal with hundreds of people. There is no formal mechanism on how to go about it. And even now they have said to Tengeneze committee to go and discuss. In other words, they are not willing to move the issue forward. So this is why you see that it took a number of years for the American cabinet to be set up. And finally, he started meeting with the heads of department to give opinion on issues, written opinions that would then help him and guide him on how to move forward. When the second president came in, the mechanism was pretty much set up. So let's come back home to Kenya's first cabinet. The resolution of that picture is so low, we tried to expand it, we realized it doesn't work. See, technology. <laughs> so we had to keep it small. But you can see it was a small cabinet of 15 members. Tell me about the ignorance, poverty, and disease. Does anyone? I know definitely those in my age group here, they know. What's the issue of poverty, ignorance, and disease? Somebody. Dean, I hope you didn't tell them you were going to appraise them based on the answers they give me. Yeah, and so they are really weighing. Do I answer that question? Do I not answer? Please, feel free. Yes. Correct. And therefore, when the first cabinet was set up, a lot of the policies, the strategic thrust was to fight poverty, ignorance, and disease. And uh, you realize that some of these issues in a different name are still the issues of the day. Not just in Kenya, even worldwide. Because life has continued to evolve, issues have become more complex, and so the endeavor continues. That was Kenya's first cabinet. Let's look at the constitution of Kenya. Unlike the American one, for example, the Kenyan uh, constitution anticipated a cabinet. So these are the benefits, perhaps, of coming to independence later, because cultures and traditions had matured. So the first uh, constitution envisaged offices of the minister, who would be, and this would be established by parliament. The president was to appoint ministers from among members of the National Assembly. You heard what the dean said. This was a parliamentary system, the Westminster type of government. So ministers would come from the National Assembly. Is that the case today? No, now there is a separation. There would also be a cabinet at 17-1, constituting of the president, the vice president, and other ministers. And the function of the cabinet is to aid and advise the president of the government of Kenya. And the cabinet is collectively responsible to the National Assembly, for all things done under the authority of the president or the VP in the execution of his office. Do you see the clarity? As opposed to where we came from, in Kings of England, Privy Council, then we went to the United States and the Senate and allow me to set up a mechanism and the willingness, there's such clarity that lends itself. So this then became the cabinet a formally recognized mechanism, the highest strategic decision-making body in the country designed to design, approve, and push government policy for the benefit of the people of Kenya. And the same cabinet would then come to advise the president and guide and give insight on issues of the day. Let's try and transport ourselves to 1963, I don't think any of us here was born. Which are some of the conversations you'd have wanted to listen in on and hear what they're saying? Uh-huh. Which one? 
land. What about it? Just try and color it for us. Do you want to stand up? No, just try. Imagine. Imagine there are conversations anyone would have wanted to listen in and hear what did they say? Why did they say what they said? Uh huh. You heard her? You know you might be a politician, my friend. <laughs> Let that person hear. Just say it. It's, it's a good thought. Um, the administration and partition of land, of course, the Great. I think, actually, you've really gone to the center of things because land defines a lot of issues in this country, isn't it? Land defines a lot of fights and decisions on this continent. Can you imagine what the conversation might have been. That there is all this land, all these settlers are living. How are we going? What is the policy that we will use to ensure that Kenyans get land? And have you seen different countries adopt different policy positions? Is the way Zimbabwe did it the same way Kenya did it? No. So these are conversations that were critical to be held at that point depending on how you view, you, you view land as a factor of production, how do you want this land to cascade to newly independent Kenyans? Do you want smallholder farming? Do you want plantation farming? Do you want to go the cooperative way? Which way do you want to go? That definitely must have occupied a lot of time of the early independent cabinet. Another issue? No, just a moment. Uh huh. Great. A v another very seminal conversation. Remember, Africans could not even grow cash crops like coffee and tea, right? So are we going to allow Africans to grow coffee or tea? Do they know how to grow coffee or tea? How are they going to do this? Or oh, we allow the colonialists to stay, to carry on growing the coffee or tea? Can you just imagine the kind of conversation that must have happened then? How will the financing and the acquisition of this property happen? What is the method? What is the formula? What happens if we give them this kind of access and it doesn't work? How are we going to claw back? For sure, that is a conversation that was held. And even as you move, as you move to later day cabinets, I would have personally wanted to hear what the discussion was around COVID. You remember the COVID of shut down the country? Everybody go home, shut down the schools, let everybody go home, bring all the Kenyans. Remember the ones who came in on KQ and even the pilots died? Do you think that was an easy conversation? No. Were the risks known and understood? No, but decisions needed to be made. Cabinet conversations worldwide are very interesting, very delicate, very sensitive. They carry a high level of risk and responsibility. So I'm happy that looking into later day conversations and constitutions, you see the clarity that has come in time. Let's look at the constitution um, of Kenya 2010. There you are. That's the constitution that defines our framework today. Article 152, cabinet consists of the president, deputy president, attorney general, not less than 14, not more than 22 cabinet secretaries. Are you seeing precision? Because in the past, we have known cabinets that have been very large. Now, the structure sets it even within numbers. And then, Article 152 2, the president will nominate, and with the approval of the National Assembly, the cabinet secretaries will be appointed. And I'm sure not too long ago, we saw the vetting and the nomination of cabinet secretaries. 152 3, that's the big departure. A cabinet secretary shall not be a member of parliament. This is now the entry 
of the presidential system that is very, very similar to the American system, a departure from the Westminster type. You know, Dean, I've often wondered whether we are truly, fully 100% presidential or whether we are a mongrel struggling between some aspects of Westminster, some aspects of presidential, because indeed evolution takes time as we move towards a presidential, but indeed by the reflection of 152.3, we are headed towards the presidential. That is what the Constitution articulates for. It then goes on at 153 to even prescribe that a decision of cabinet shall be in writing. Why do you think this is important? Somebody, backbencher, I'd have been sitting there next to that guy in yellow. Tell me, why do you think, why do you think it would be important to have a cabinet decision in writing? No pressure. Mm -hmm. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, the reason behind uh, the writing, there being a writing, mm -hmm. is for there to be the intention to create legal relation. To create? R legal relation. Legal relation. Yeah. Okay, you mean like to formalize? Yeah, formalizing it. Okay, Yeah. great. It's that is the case. Because when you find something that is so complex or difficult to understand, the human mind tries to simplify it, isn't it? Or even to change it. But when something is written, it's fixed. It's fixed. It's clear what the intention was. It also guides implementation. It guides implementation. So a decision must be in writing. And then, even the process of making this decision, 153.2, is that a CS is accountable, not just individually, but also collectively. Collective responsibility in the exercise of the powers and performance of the function. I'm sure you've come through the concept called the whole of government approach, where the government must speak as one. Even in this university, I believe you have a council or a senate? You have senate. Trustees and then senate. Aha. So trustees, council, senate. Now that's the governance of this university. What would it look like if the trustees spoke north, the trustees spoke east, and the council spoke south? Would the university stand? No. It's very important to speak as one. Now, the concept of collective responsibility has certain freedoms and limitations because each of us here has a different view on a certain issue, isn't it? But once we make a decision on a certain issue, what happens to our different individual views? They disappear. We carry on with them collective responsibility, whatever was formally decided. So, so I think so far, you've been able to see just how long it takes for concepts to evolve and crystallize. Can you see that? Because we've moved from a place where, you know, I need somebody to advise me, who will advise me, who will advise me, and I pick and, you know, get some advice. And we've gone all the way to precision. Allow me to say this. When I saw what is to happen in the Kingdom of Great Britain, getting certain private people to advise you, or even the US, collecting a few people to advise you, do you see the danger, the vulnerability there of picking certain private people who are not accountable to advise the king or the leader on behalf of the people? So vulnerable, because it depends on the goodwill or otherwise of those people. So I like that the evolution has moved to more structure and accountability because then you can call out and call up. Can you call out a private individual? No. But those were the early beginnings. Let's look now at the insights of the working of the cabinet. I thought this would be useful. The organizational structure of government, the three arms 
of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. They are independent. They are also inter interdependent. Each needs the other. So I like to say that this is a space of maybe creative tension because all of them at the grand norm have the same goal, the prosperity of the nation. So at the top of the executive is His Excellency the President. You can see the cabinet there as the ultimate decision-making body. There's a security council on issues of matter security. Then the ministries, the different portfolios that uh, right now we have 22. That's at the national. And because we are a devolved system, we have the 47 county governments. Then moving on to the legislature, we have the Senate and the National Assembly at the national and the 47 county assemblies. Then the judiciary at all levels, from the magistracy all the way to the Supreme Court. This is how we are architectured. And cabinet then plays in at the executive. Let me see if it will go back. It plays in right there at the very top to pass policies. Policies which capture the manifesto or the priorities of the administration of the day. So right now, cabinet sits to be very considerative of regular government business and manifestos of Kenya Kwanzaa under the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. In the last administration, it was a different manifesto. And a lot of these policies will require national and county integration in order to deliver. Have any of you been exposed to value chains? Economics? Anybody studying economics? Economics? So anyway, a lot of production at the, in the country happens through value chains. There's an agriculture value chain starting from the farmer all the way to the factory and to export. So you find a lot of these value chains cut across national and county. So there's a lot of linkages, a lot of linkages and interactions that happen at all levels. So you see all these governance entities exist to push policies to ensure that they obtain certain expectations and promises made. Cabinet is no different. So cabinet really is a very important forum because it allows for cabinet secretaries to sit, contemplate certain proposals, consider them collectively, debate those issues, and decide on the issues facing the nation. And the operations of the cabinet are really a weaving of constitutional tradition, practices, and systems. They are not cast in the law. Because indeed, one thing that uh, I'm sure you saw in the early part of my discussion is the evolution, the evolution that happens over time. And we all continue to evolve based on our different conditions and circumstances that are happening. What are some of the policies currently under consideration that are generating a lot of interest, debate, and feedback in Kenya? Yes? The lady next to the one with the mask? The increase of the presidential term. There's a private motion that uh, was brought to increase from five to seven years. That is something that is out there. But it's a private motion, meaning it will go straight to the National Assembly because it's not pushed by the executive. Okay? Another issue that is of great interest at the moment. Guys, come on. University funding model. Oh, you're okay. Huh? University funding model is a policy that is currently under a lot of consideration. Another one? Shift. Shift, shift, shift. That's the one you wanted to say. Those are the policies currently under consideration. Tell me one issue that is likely to be potentially an issue of great discussion in this country. 
Sorry? They are done a deal. Sorry? They are done a deal. Yeah, okay, they are done a deal. In fact, already it is in the public uh, domain. You are saying something? Agriculture is always a conversation of high interest. I thought somebody would say femicide. Isn't it? It's really an issue out there in the public domain. And the question then is, is it a policy failure? Is it a society failure? What is it? And what should be done to ensure that there is safety and security for every female, every male living within this country? Let's step outside Kenya. Let's step out into the bigger world. What are some of the conversations that you think are happening in some cabinets? or even happened in the past. A conversation that you would have wanted to sit in and listen to the discussions and the considerations that were being made. Uh -huh. uh, mine would be the COVID-19 pandemic, I think. Uh, to have something of that crisis so unprecedented, I would be, I would want to listen to what the governments, the discussions they had around that. Right. I mean, that definitely, it must have colored many, many cabinets. Did you want to say something? Okay. Uh huh. Uh, for me, it comes down to the decision of the US government to fund or finance the. Israeli Palestinian war. Right? Even thinking of the earlier ones of Iraq and Iran, you wonder what the considerations uh, might have been. Definitely, there are things that have framed the story of the world that have been discussed. I wonder what conversation happened in 1994 in South Africa around apartheid that we end this system, and I'm sure there were those who are for we keep the system. And if we don't keep it, what happens? If we keep it, what happens? What's going to happen? I wonder what conversation happens in those countries that are sinking. You know, there are some countries that are sinking in the ocean. What kind of conversations do they have there? So we are sinking at the rate of 1.5 mm per year. So we've got 200 more years to go. So now what does that mean? Do we start looking for other citizenship? So what goes on, you know? What if this rate gets accelerated? Oh, we have a volcano on the island. If it becomes active, we are likely to sink in 10 years. What does that mean for those who are born and those who are yet to be born? I mean, do you see the complexity? It's complex. It's complex. I wonder what kind of conversations will happen for cabinets in the future. Let's go into the future. Can somebody see the future with me? Tell me about a conversation around AI, artificial intelligence, and the capabilities to take over human capability. To what extent do we want that to happen? What kind of framework or regime do you want that to happen in? Do you see the possibility of that conversation? So really, guys, you see why I'm asking you guys to elevate. Wherever space, where, whichever space you will be in as a leader, these are the conversations. These are the conversations that continue to shape our world. And I'm mindful when I talk about shaping the world, because Kenya has demonstrated leadership that ascends beyond the country to the world. So let's also not limit ourselves, right? So the cardinal rules that operate within a cabinet a cabinet is the ultimate arbiter of all government policy. No policy will come out for observance by citizens that has not gone through cabinet. And decisions made at cabinet are binding on all members of the government. And as I had said earlier, it's a space for individual accountability, collective accountability in the exercise of their functions and the performance of the functions that they have. So it's serious business, no doubt. It is serious business. It invites 
the possibility to speak truth to power, to call back issues that lead to policy failure, but not to call back to fold hands, oh yeah. It's to call back and to revisit for corrective action. You must always keep moving forward. You must always keep moving forward. So it's a very engaging space. And these are very foundational issues on cabinet uh, business. It calls for an expression of confidence and an exercise of the whole of government capabilities to make it happen. Because indeed, government and governance are complex. They are complex, even just by the history that uh, we went through before. And it has vertical and horizontal accountability. The National Assembly, the Senate, the CSAs are called up, and we see it on TV every other time when they are being questioned. I came across an article, and I just thought, maybe sitting here, because we are a young country, as against those that are 200, 300 years old. You know the story of the locomotive? Before, 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 what were they using? Horses. So the streets of London were made for? For horses. So tell me what that looks like in winter when it's raining with horses and their business. You can see rivers of business eh? everywhere. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Horses everywhere, all over the place. And then enter Daimler Benz with a locomotive. And suddenly, we no longer need to use a horse. We can now use this motorized contraption. Who are the first people to ride on these contraptions? Sorry? The elite, the wealthy. Because it was status symbol. Let's shift to here. Who are the first people to own a mobile? The elite. And in those early days, if you had a mobile, when you sat down at a restaurant with your friend, you ordered for a soda and a glass for the, for the mobile. <laughs> yeah. Early, early days. The mobile is the people used to put them in glasses. Because it was so, I mean, it was expensive. It, it was a status symbol. You need to know that I have a... A mobile. So anyway, so the elites were the ones that were using these motorized vehicles. What were some of the early thought processes when this contraption hit the road? You know, by the way, it used to travel at how many kilometers per hour? Huh? 12 kilometers per hour. Have you ever heard of a speed like that today? 12. But 12 was very fast, eh? So they started saying, if you use this, this thing, it was called a contraption, you'll die early. Because it moves at such speed, your soul <laughs> will disconnect. <laughs> it will disconnect from the body. So even as you use it, just be knowing. These are the dangers you will expose yourself to. Where do I give this whole story? Can you imagine the policy changes that had to be put in place to convert London from the London of horses to the London of, of cars, motor vehicles. The debates, the health concerns on the health of individuals and the impact on people's hearts and souls. A conversation that today sounds incredible, isn't it? But they had to happen. The policies that had to be put in place on how these roads will be structured. Certainly, I'm sure they had to clear buildings in order to put the two lanes because uh, cars now need a bigger space. The policies to be put in place for parking, all the regulations that come. Can you see the multiplicity of issues that had to come? So it's the same thing here when we have to work out a policy change or a policy proposal on a certain issue. So indeed, it calls for vertical, horizontal accountability. Do you see a possibility that today, that system that we are talking about of Privy Council and private advisors sitting in a cabinet, do you see it working today? I just call a few people. And then, of course, depending on the individual, you call the ones who tell you what you want to hear. 
See, that's the human tendency. Right. So we've moved. We've moved Nabado. Right? So we've gone to cabinet. A decision has been passed. Now it's about delivery. And this delivery is the one usually of like 2027. Show us. Show us what did you do? Where does it start? I think this pictogram is very good. It starts with a political pitch. Remember I talked about the priorities of an administration? It's the political pitch, the political correctness. Why did you get into power? Because you promised ABC. That's the political pitch. Then parliament, which will sit to pass these decisions, is addressed on these priorities that they may debate, they may consider them, they may be aware, so that when the time comes and all these policies and the legislative uh, proposals are coming, they are aware and aligned. Then now you have the policy in place, you have the legislative proposals. But how do you make it work? You need the budgets, the plans. And this is why with the finance bill uh, happening and being dropped, you see the impact because without a budget, then implementation becomes a, a challenge. But assuming one, two, and three are in place, then the issues move to cabinet for decision-making processes. This looks simple. I'll just show you a more close to reality pictogram on what it looks like when uh, this approval process is happening uh, for a decision to be said to truly happen. So it starts with the strategic direction. That's the political pitch. Remember the one I said, bottom-up economic transformation agenda? And every administration has its own plan. So based on the strategic thrust, you then develop policies that will escort those things. For example, there was an the issue of financial inclusion and empowerment of the hustler, the person at the bottom. What were some of the very early policies that were passed? The policy for the hustler fund. Then the fund was put in place. If the policy had not been put in place, would you have had the hustler fund? No. So that's the connection. So you go to policy development, and there's a lot of consultation and public participation that happens to ensure that the political pitch is aligned with the technical, the technical pitch. Because everything has a method, isn't it? And the two have to be uh, together. Also, to ensure that there is buy-in from the citizen for whom this policy is being made. So once that is done and public participation undertaken, you then go into the policy review space where the advisors, the economic advisors look at it, the strategy office, the policy office, the political office, so that you're able to tick off that some of these efforts have been undertaken, that when you begin to communicate to the citizens, that there has been that vetting and quality assurance on that policy. I know, as I say it, it sounds so simple, but policies are complex. So even with the best effort, I doubt that you will ever find a place where there is a choir 100% saying is good, is good, is good. There will always be nooks and crannies requiring clarification and even uh, correction and revisiting. So after that, we then move to the approval process where the treasury is very important because of the financing. The attorney general is very important to ensure legal compliance. And only after that has happened does the matter hit the cabinet. Do you now see why the kings and the US presidents were saying, I need guidance? Can you imagine they were in the absence of that cabinet is one person? How? It's a challenge. So I'm thankful that now there are structures, there are structures, very elaborate structures that allow for consideration of these items. So once a matter goes through cabinet and cabinet has committees and all that, it then moves to implementation. This is how you're in Shashif. This is how you're in university funding model. This is how you're in agriculture fertilizer subsidy. 
kind of things, they have all passed through cabinet. So you move to implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. And at that point is when you now say, was this policy successful? Was this policy a reluctant policy? Was this a policy that failed? Is this a policy that requires some tweaking in order to achieve the intended goal? So it's a very considerative process that continues from generation to generation. So my invitation is after you see this process, and depending on your area of interest and passion and wherever you will find yourself, what is your role? Because it's not easy. It is not easy, and it's okay to stand up and shout. It's fine. You shout, and then what? What is the future you want? So that you call for that future and you walk towards that future. The future that we all desire. Because the process is complex, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. But there is a way we can intentionally drive in that direction. And I'm very happy because I know like in, in Kabarak, there have been a few students who have invented, uh, have been involved in innovation, isn't it? They have been involved in innovation. They have been recognized for those innovations, like the one of West Pokot and registration of baths, isn't it? That's somebody making a contribution right here. Because the challenges that were there before, will they be there if that kind of innovation is scaled up? No. We will be better for, for that. So what is your contribution? What is the role that you will play to ensure that some of the challenges, some of the problems that are being experienced today will no longer be that way, that life will actually be easier and better for others into the future. So a little note on cabinet committees. Because of the complexity that I have just demonstrated, we have now agreed one person cannot sit and decide all these things, isn't it? Also, we have agreed even a cabinet cannot sit and they crunch all these things themselves. You now need to create committees that specialize and look deeply, spend a lot more time. So currently we have three uh, committees and all matters that the cabinet must first go to these committees. For those who will end up in private sector, it's very similar to board work. It's very similar to board work where you will find subcommittees set up to look at the various issues, look at them in depth, and then advise the board on the direction to go. What are the scenarios that you looked at? Did you do a cost-benefit analysis? Did you do, it's called what, SWOT analysis? There's PESTEL analysis, and I'm sure there are others. What are the evaluations that you went through to identify these are the three options, and we advise you to go with this one because of A, B, C, D, something like that. It's kind of the same system. And once a committee makes a decision, it cannot be acted on until it is passed by the cabinet. Because it's not obvious that because the committee has looked at it, the cabinet will agree. No. Cabinet will look at all those committee decisions. It can approve them, yes, 100%. It can also reject them. It can also vary them. It can also say, guys, go back, relook at this issue in a more considerative manner, pay attention to this or the other. Also remember the world is so dynamic, at the point that you met to make the decision, things may have changed. So whereas you may have made a good decision at that point, things may have changed, and suddenly you need to relook at the issue. And that's just how it is. Let me touch a little bit on principal secretaries. While they do not sit in cabinet, they are very critical in the workings of the cabinet and the workings of government because their role is to advise the cabinet secretary on all questions of policy that come within the scope of that ministerial portfolio. So you find that a principal secretary is very informed, like now, for example, and very regrettably, Recently, we had the death of that lady in that, um, uh, that uh, process, that beauty process. You remember? And it's very sad and very unfortunate. But what has happened now? You've seen the Ministry of Health go to the front. They have embarked on an enforcement. 
and there is enforcement happening to all clinics of that type to ensure that that situation does not happen, that you do not have those kind of entities operating with quacks or out of health and safety standards. So this is where principal secretaries come in, very important to safeguard government policy to ensure that it is upheld and that if there be any infraction, that then enforcement and the desirable enforcement activity, including prosecution, is undertaken. So once cabinet meets, decisions are made. And uh, in the fifth administration, we took the stance uh, recognizing that the citizen is at the center of the action and started to issue releases on decisions made so that the people know what is government thinking, where are the policies going, where are the opportunities, and therefore we usually issue a dispatch from cabinet. And it's a very instructive document. If you are interested in matters governance, which you should all be, I would request you to please follow the cabinet office page um, on Twitter so that uh, you then get these dispatches when they are released to see what it is was decided on the various sectors. So looking now closely at the cabinet office, this office was set up in Article 154 of the Constitution. This is the office that I occupy. And this office is responsible for identifying the business of cabinet or the business of government, arranging it and prioritizing it. So, and keeping the minutes of cabinet and communicating the decisions. So if I was to step out of government, back to corporate, in corporate, is there any business without a strategic plan? Does this university have a strategic plan? Right, so my strategic plan is the manifesto. So I also now look at the manifesto to see what was committed, what was decided, by when, what is the target, where are we, and from there you're able to actually identify which portfolio to look to, to be able to stimulate business and schedule it for consideration by, by cabinet and then convey those decisions. Of course, we handle other decisions and other functions as would be directed by cabinet. So this is a constitutional office under Article 154. We are heavily governed by a cabinet manual. Remember we said it is not, uh, the issues of cabinet are not a function of legislation. So it's about practice and tradition. So the manual is the one that sets out how cabinet conducts its business. It gives guidance for ministers. How do you consult? How do I deal when I have a matter and he's the minister in a certain area and we are collaborating on the same issues? I have a different view, he has a different view. How do we ensure that at the end of the day when we face the rest of you, we face you as one? Not me saying, me, I'm going north. Me, I'm going south. That's my view, that's his view. No, it has all this kind of information on how to deal with it. And uh, of course the inspiration is taken from the Westminster system, uh, the parliamentary system, and it anticipates that changes will happen. It is not static and it will continue to evolve if only to make the conduct of cabinet business easier over time and will be updated periodically. So do you see that we are still in the space of change? Yes, yes. Even after hundreds of years, change is still happening and it will continue. By the time you guys are doing the jobs we are doing, again it will be now something else. Maybe I'll come and sit here and I'm listening and I'm wondering, was that the job I used to do? Because of the way it has so changed as times continue to change. So what are the kind of things that go in as cabinet business? Because remember, GOK is a corporate entity in perpetual succession. That's what took care of our forefathers, our parents, us, even our children, isn't it? For as long as Kenya continues to exist. So, so long as you live within the boundaries of Kenya or you identify with Kenya, 
then uh, this business is your business, isn't it? So these are the issues, issues that are of significant policy requirement, public interest, matters that are statutory, like passing of the budgets, for example, proposals that affect the government's financial position or financial commitments like the loans. You, you've always had the conversation around the debt level of government, matters concerning other arms of government, the judiciary and the like, uh, reports to the select committees of the National Assembly and any other reporting requirements that cabinet wants to know as to understand are we safe? Are we okay? Are we operating in the right direction? Is this the desirable direction to go? Is there something that we need to think differently? I mean, you can only imagine if small businesses, because I'll call them small businesses, corporates, they, people go to boards and go for retreats even for a week, isn't it? So maybe it would be okay for us to retreat for a month. Niswali too. Because I know corporates go for retreats even for a week, a week. How should it be for GOK? It's huge. It's complex. So there's a lot to be discussed. There's a lot of input required by each and every one of us at the different levels. Because bottom line, we just must move forward. Let me look at some of the achievements that uh, we have made in the fifth administration. Um, on 30th of January, yeah, 30th of January last year, we automated 100% for cabinet business. So we are together. I'm sure here your, your council is automated, isn't it, Tim? You're automated. So we are together. As we are at 100%. So as we are even ahead, we automated at 100% on the e-cabinet system, what that does is that it now makes tracking easier and we would like to see what data and analytics would look like. Because once you're able to achieve some level of data collection, it means that you're then moving towards policy making with data, data driven policy making. And we are really excited about that. Second, the cabinet office, remember I said it can be given additional responsibility. It has the responsibility for onboarding e-citizen services, which I chair. And uh, we came in from 397 services. We came in at 397 services in 2022. We are now at uh, 19,000 services. And that is a factor of about 4,686%. Have you seen a percentage like that in a short while? So that's a big leap of services. Now, what that does for you, because you people are now the ones who are really the beneficiaries, is in my time, I'm sure their time, the dean's time, to engage with government, you need to get up, walk, get ready, get into a vehicle to go to a government office. Is that your reality, isn't it? Eh? You go to a government office, you sit by a, a, a shaky bench, then you're told, anakuja. You wait, then you're told, eh, bina masaa iko, na leo ni Friday, come on, Monday. You go home, you've lost a day, two days, come back again, then you're told, oh, where are you le? Okay, you're told, okay, end of room five. You go there, the thing requires somebody to tick, another one to sign, another one to stamp, then you find the one of stamping is not there so again you go so by the time some transaction is sorted out is a frustration but this is not your reality my friends this is not your reality in fact we don't even want it to be your reality because it's time to engage with dignity that you sit at your desk you know what it is you want you want a passport you're booking to schedule for some exam or whatever and by the tapping on a machine, you're able to process. This is where the world has gone. And this is for you, is for those in diaspora, is for those others who are not Kenyans who want to interact with Kenya as a route for government services. This for sure is a change I have seen in my lifetime. 
I'm happy about this because this was not my reality growing up. Was it for you? For sure it wasn't. So hence my question then. Uh huh. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I think they didn't hear. Maybe you need to amplify so that they see what the, what the big change, the big transformation is. I just meant to amplify what you're saying by giving them a lived experience. Um, that when we went to campus, we needed to fill forms. They are help forms, eh? and could only be obtained at government offices, usually what you call counties now, close close by, county headquarters. So you have to look for fare and go, wait the whole day, and many times you had to bribe to get the form, not the money. To get the form. The form, then apply. To then get the money. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So guys, you can see that the change is happening and I think it's happening in a good space because it, it now leaves you, as they say, the world is your limit. It's what it is you're looking for, you will get it. And we are not done yet because so far, these are services that government is giving you. We will be going into a phase where we will say, now, this is what government is giving you, but in the space of customer delight, what do you want government to give you? You see, it reverses it. Reverses it. And we will be waiting with a, a lot of anticipation to hear because I expect a lot of that feedback to come from people like you. This is the kind of thing I would want. This is the kind of thing I would want. This is how much I'd be ready to pay for it. Because if indeed it is a service that should surely be given by a government to a citizen, why not? Why not? It should be given. The next thing is that uh, in doing uh, the e-citizen platform was the realization whereas uh, a person with disability can be escorted to a government office, you realize how deeply excluding it would be if the platforms were not adjusted for persons with disability, you realize. And because this is about government services to all Kenyans, the margin for exclusion should be zero. So. One of the great achievements was to achieve digital inclusion for persons with disability by incorporation of accessibility features on the e-citizen platform. And this was done just because of ensuring that nobody is left behind. But guess what happened? As this was done, apparently it, is a, it set the standard for Africa. And just last, uh, two, about two months ago, it was showcased. It was showcased in front of 47 African countries as the standard to follow. So I think we are really trying, right? To ensure that even as we move forward, we move forward together and move forward together in a dignifying manner. We should never have to wait for a case, a litigation by a PWD that you've left me out. Just put them there intentionally and then we continue to improve the service then lastly we've also introduced cabinet learning sessions in recognition that there are so many emerging issues cyber security privacy data protection climate change carbon credits what else and yet we all must really be in the know you know to some point to be able to actually address these issues so that that way we ensure that we are able to bring the best of capabilities into policy making. So I'm coming to the end. But in that whole conversation that I have given, I have drawn a certain conclusion which is framed by this Yoruba proverb, that where you will sit, your old, will show where you stood in your youth. This, for me, speaks very loudly, especially because I'm a citizen. Because I know that when, where I will sit when I am old, accessing services, because we access these services until we die, isn't it? It really shows where I stood when I stood, isn't it? 
So I ask you the same thing. You sit here, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, in the various disciplines, in your youth. You know, everything looks bright, everything looks great, maybe not much responsibility. I invite you to just enter another layer there and ask yourself. And I like uh, when the lady started off, she talked about rebirth of a nation. We are growing. We are 60. 60, we are 60 what? 62? 62 or 63? How old are we? 60? Sorry? 61. We are 61. So we are fairly mature, aren't we? Isn't it a good time to really have a conversation about who we want to be with some kind of boldness? Better to try. You be failing, isn't it? Then to say, I didn't bother. So that even when the possibility existed, you did not even take the chance. I believe in taking the chance. Take the chance and you will be so surprised that it will happen. So this is for you. As you stand in your youth, please determine where you will sit when you're old. I think that is very, very much within your hands. Those are our handles. Secretary to Cabinet, there is Cabinet Office. We are on X, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook, we are on LinkedIn. Please join us. I think this is a journey that should concern each and every one of us. And nobody should feel like it doesn't concern them or they are too small. Too small, too little, too inconsequential. Oh, no, 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 no. It, this is a conversation for everybody. And it really matters. And that's why I'm so privileged. Thank you, Dean, for allowing us to come and have this conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, that's Um, thank you so much for that. Um, the Dean and I were remarking how much, how enjoyable that session was. Um, my co-instructor in constitutional law, Mr. Ashira Maina, actually had raised one of the issues that you have raised about our transition from a parliamentary to a presidential system and just how slowly it has gone and as you are talking I, it brought a number of questions so i will reserve the first question for myself but let me make the transition first we are moving to question time um thank you thank you for the excitement uh, we are moving to question time i will ask if you're online and you'd like a question asked on your behalf please put it in the q and a and um, on Zoom. If you are on YouTube, unfortunately, we cannot scour all the comments to see the questions. But if you're on Zoom, please use the Q&A and we shall select a few within the time that we have. OK, so questions. Um, Who would like to ask one? Um, I'm seeing three gentlemen, gentlemen there, one lady here and two more gentlemen here. I think we'll start uh, there with me first though. Um, yes, so my question is, um, and this is not so much a question of politics as it is of, uh, of operations. So we have um, one, of the, one of the curious things about Kenya after 2003 is the increase in uh, loose termed quote unquote coalition governments where after two, two, 2007 we had our most formalized one and with handshakes sometimes you get co governments that did not prepare the same script coming in so for example kk and Azimio, the kind of marriage that's happening now, they were both not trading from the bottom up. 
economic um, economic model. Um, so one of the things that is curious is how do you form, considering that now you have cabinet secretaries who are in charge of um, key ministries, how do you help with the formation of um, coherent cabinet strategies? Is it through committees? Um, how, how do you fit in these cabinet proposals that might come from ministers who are not within the original coalition and who might not have bought into the original um, strategic plan for the organization? Uh, how do you create cohesion? Okay, so let's begin. Um, that gentleman in white there. My name is Elvis Yagon, and I have two questions. The first question, what steps are taken to prevent conflict of interest among the cabinet members? That's the first question. The second question, how is the cabinet adopting to the economic crisis we are currently experiencing as a country, considering the fact that the public de debt is, has accumulated to an approximate amount of 10.6 trillion as per July 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So I'm um, Molly Gift, 1.1 student. So my question is, you as a woman, how do you handle the pressure that comes to you fight like because people are different and maybe some of the people like handle you different because of the gender how do you handle the pressure that you get there in your office and how do you make sure that it does not hinder your your responsibilities that you have as a secretary in the cabinet thank you my name as i answer accordingly to is ndishu lewis first year student as well and I have two questions. Um, some material was shared with us on the Shindiga presidency. And I love that you've allegorized the cabinet with the Privy Council of the King. And then I direct my question to this. If we allegorize the cabinet to the Privy Council, then does that mean that we liken the president to the king? And my subsequent question would be this. Where does the president um, derive, or the office of the president derive its authority? Is it an inherent jurisdiction that does not, that, that does not presuppose legislation to make policy? And in this, in this essence, um, under the constitution, we find no office of the prime cabinet secretary. Yes? But the office has been mandated by an executive order. So what, what relation is there between the inherent powers of the king and those of the president? And what limits are there to such um, jurisdiction? And secondly, I really thought you would not mention this, and I thought this would make me stand out. <laughs> but um, all, the, all, all, all the best. Uh, thank you for making us all informed. And my question is on um, the dig digitization of business records. We, um, not too long ago, we had an incident of um, hacking of government, of government, um, what do we call them? Government... Um, forgive me, systems, thank you, by um, Sudan. So my concern, and a concern we, we might all share as Kenyans, is with this transformation of the cabinet, and you, you are very deliberate to mention that the workings of the cabinet are very delicate and sensitive. Were those considerations made, and since you are... Um, an integral part of the inauguration of 
the 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 first uh, cabinet process, the first um, online, without any papers. So were those concerns put into considerations? Uh, for instance, the the um, the intricacies of and, and the, the delicate uh, nature of cabinet um, proceedings and how it would affect us as a nation should malicious and foreign or whoever it is decides to uh, use the same networks and you you actually mentioned that technology has yeah, yes. a mind of its own i think she's got a question it's about <laughs> the integrity of the integrity and also digital. technical issues that is what i was getting yes getting the technical to. integrity yes of the Thank digitized you. cabinet system good afternoon once again so my name is adeline chelagat i'm a fourth year law student and so far it's been a very lovely session uh, no i have two questions so the first one is i would like to know the type of conversations that happen when for example you had these policies i know we're not supposed to get so much into policies but to just understand the conversation so for example you have the shift the financing model for the universities the housing levy so when we have such policies that have a kind of disconnect with the public right where we had for example the president had to go and explain to people and give a whole rundown and this for the dispatch from cabinet that is now happening how do you try to reconcile that when you have your policies you want to execute them but we're having a lot of disconnect from the public maybe from the judiciary for example the housing levy so what do you do about that thing that the time might be running for the end of that period my second question is with regards to in during times of emergencies how i just want to know okay maybe for example there's a terrorist attack now what do you do now do away with the procedures put in or the procedures put in place i would just like to understand the the response the immediate response that happens during those times thank you um, i think we can start with those and then if we have more time we shall take a second or oh, you have a zoom question we can take that in the next round okay great that's a lot of very loaded uh, questions i'll give it my best uh, effort so the first question was about um, how do you uh, reconcile uh, for coherence at cabinet when you have um, members within that uh, very distinguished cohort who did not necessarily come through the same kind of philosophical spine, um, if you will. I think uh, my answer to this is very easy because you've been invited in and you have the right to stay in or stay out, isn't it? So when you're invited in and uh, you're invited in and you know this is how we roll, this is what we prescribe to, then I think it allows an opportunity and a platform for dialogue on this is how we would expect you to deal. And indeed, when we saw the, some of the cabinet secretaries being vetted, there were some uh, moments of humor when uh, some were asked, you know, but you are such a critique of this and that. And they said, you know, yes, I was a critique, but now I have spent more time. I have looked at this and I am persuaded. But all to say that uh, I think when you're invited, you prescribe, you subscribe, then you move together. I say that and yet do not shy away from difficult conversations because I do not think that in, uh, any, in any setup that you only belong to the setup because you agree. Then it really makes for a very lackluster kind of situation, but is to allow a platform for meaningful and very engaged conversations so long as the goal remains clear. That would be my response to that. Then um, <clears throat> the second one, what steps are taken to prevent a conflict of interest? Uh, I believe this was meant at the cabinet level and even for public or civil servants uh, working. Already the constitution sets out some very broad th thresholds. Article 10, Article 232 on the values and principles of public service. There is a chapter 6 on integrity. 
all those parameters are parameters geared towards ensuring that if you follow, you will already diminish or decimate chances of conflict of interest. But even having said all that, there are the active disclosures. For example, if you're sitting on a board in a state corporation and you're conflicted on the issue because of association or other attribution on that issue, you're required to actively record, meaning you're required to actively declare that uh, you have <clears throat> you are involved in a certain uh, setup or angle that leads you to be in a situation of conflict of interest and therefore you'd like to be excused we also know at the judiciary that uh, not all matters brought before judges um, um no let me revisit that not every judge is suitable to sit and consider every matter brought before them and this is where we have provisions for judges to recuse themselves from considering certain matters so the constitution is replete with those uh, provisions and we do have standalone pieces of legislation that also take care of that then there was a question on how is government adapting to the economic crisis that we are facing in kenya and there was a particular pointer to the level of rising public debt, I think at uh, one trillion or something of the sort. I don't know how many of you saw the papers yesterday. The Standard or, or the Star, the front page, that was saying that the worst is behind us. Did you see that? Uh, because there are certain markers. I'm not an economist, but in economics, apparently there are certain broad markers that uh, are looked at to sort of test the economic stability of a country. And in Kenya, some of those is the price of uh, fuel, the price of sugar, the price of flour, unga, the dollar exchange rate. And all those have gone down. All those have gone down now as at uh, October 2022. They have all gone down. And indeed, the article went ahead and noted that the debt level has risen marginally. It has risen marginally. Oh, another factor was also inflation. Inflation has gone down and uh, GDP is at 5.5 percent. All these were very positive indicators. So I read the article with a lot of interest because at the end of it, it said, but people are not feeling the effect. They don't have money in the pocket. And I wondered to myself, is this the effect of the finance bill? Remember my presentation about the political pitch, the plans, and then the budgets? So you can have all the plans, but if you don't have the budget, are you able to roll out your plans? No. We need to get it right because everything else is set up. Are you with me? That's, that's how I process that. That's how I would answer this uh, question that uh, we are adopting progressively. We need to engage very, very intentionally because it's not often that things are set up like that, isn't it? Then, um, a question from Gift. How do I cope with the pressure as a woman in my role? In fact, uh, Gift, I thought you would say the pressure and the character development because after going through Kusalimiwa, hey, <laughs> and the 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 the, the, the uh, what do you call the hate speech? Uh, you know, in the last few weeks over the the impeachment proceedings, um, my conclusion on that was, and this is why I said that we all must elevate, because as you desire all these things, he said he would like to be a politician, and the others who have been all these big things. Everything comes with a privilege and a responsibility, isn't it? You just must be clear what the responsibility is so that if you're doing these things in keeping with the requirement of your responsibility, then treat it as character development and keep moving. And this is why I said, even as uh, there were all those things of Kusalimiwa, you saw Kenyans, even Salimiwa, senators in the United States, they had to sit in Senate to watch. To watch. And I said, I mean, it's a demonstration of our know-how and our ability in the world, but why on earth would you salimi a senator in the U.S.? You know, I wish you, you, were, you were flooring uh, politicians and demanding, show me what you have for my age, my generation, and the like. Um, 
for that. But uh, indeed, suffice to say, a lot of uh, character development, a call for resilience and determination, and I think this is the call for each and every one of us. Then the next question was the allegory um, that I did to cabinet and the Privy Council. I think that's the closest I could have done it, but suffice to say, I mean, a king rules by decree. We are a constitutional democracy. So some privileges and spaces that are open uh, for other types of rulership might not be open uh, for us. And uh, that space of constitutional democracy is about engagement. Are we doing it? Are we really doing it? Or oh, it's there in the papers, it's there in the constitution, but we do not engage it to extract the juice as it should be done. And I think that really then leaves the responsibility back to us. Then on digitization of cabinet uh, records, I could tell from your question that you think manual records are safer. My view is so different. Yes, indeed, digitization has its own risks and vulnerabilities because one button spreads everything all over. But now, even with the manual, really the difference is not much. Uh, and indeed, yes, there were considerations on uh, the classified nature of cabinet records, the sensitivity uh, of those documents, but I would like us to view that around the prism of accountability. Never before did we have cabinet dispatches telling you what has happened in cabinet. So that yes, it is secret, but also the public knows. But truly, there are solutions that need to be put in place to firewall information that it is only available on a need-to-know basis for who needs to know and what it is they need to know. Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, I think, just a month ago. You remember when all the aviation systems in the world crashed? What did that feel like? I mean, it was unimaginable. Flights were not moving for, I think, two, three days, all because of a technology hitch. Something did happen. These are things that are bound to carry on because the world is rapidly digitizing and manual, going manual, I think is not the way to go. We just have to up our game and put in place platforms and infrastructure um, to, protect, to protect and uh, to deter where infractions happen and to punish where there is mischief. Because indeed, the impact, as you rightly noticed, can be very damaging should it happen. Then on to the next question, how do you reconcile disconnects of policy when you have policies that have disconnected uh, with, the, with the public? How did that happen? Now, you recall that the complex formula that I showed there about how policies go through. And I said at some point that even with the best of policies, you're unlikely to have a 100% choir you will still have spaces of uh, uh, you know, disenchantment and you will have places of high excitement. But how do you reconcile this? In the case of the finance bill, for example, what happened? It was dropped. That is part of reconciling. That yes, you have come to the place, you have reconciled that this was a policy proposal. It is not gaining in terms of ownership and it has been withdrawn. This is what happened in June, uh, July, after the Gen Z protests. Another way to reconcile is uh, to have these things tested in litigation, like happened with the housing levy. If you remember, the affordable housing policy uh, was taken to court, uh, and the claim was that it is unconstitutional because it was requiring uh, an involuntary contribution. And uh, the Court of Appeal, I think two weeks ago, said it is constitutional. That's yet another way of reconciling. Because if I came here as a member of the executive and told you, no, it is constitutional, you said, hey, what else did you expect her to say? Right? So it took another arm of government to actually look uh, at the policy proposal, the way it had been made and through the process, and the Court of Appeal actually found that it was constitution. I'm not sure whether the matter has progressed to the Supreme Court or whether it has rested, but uh, suffice to say that for now, it has been found that um, it, it, is, it is okay and uh, it is therefore going to undergo um, implementation.
Then the last question on public emergency. I understood public emergency here to mean any type of emergency, even hurricanes and everything. Is that what you meant? Is any type of emergency. So now there is a global framework on uh, emergencies because uh, emergencies happen even to the best of us. And there's a convention called the Tampere Convention that uh, is about, I think, 20 years old. And Kenya is a signatory of the Tampere Convention. What that does is that in the event of an emergency of scale, um, aid and support will come to signatories of this kind of convention to support them. So that's at the global level, and Kenya has subscribed. But coming home, even our constitution has provisions on declaration of public emergencies, because uh, an emergency is a very serious thing. And by the time a country declares a state of emergency, it means that this is beyond us. And uh, I think this is where we almost got with COVID-19. But should it be necessary to go there, then the National Assembly would exercise its powers to declare a public emergency. And then the process of running a country in emergency uh, would, would ensue in, within a state of emergency. Yeah. I think we have space for questions from the online group and uh, maybe a question from a member of faculty, uh, the Dean. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that inspiring lecture and educative as well, historical. Um, and I think you should also consider what you said earlier, coming to the academy once you are finished with the, <laughs> the other side of state service. <laughs> thank you. Um, some questions in my head right there. One, we have seen transition to online, public, public um, broadcasted parliament, public broadcasted courts. Do we foresee that cabinet will go this way soon? Or possibly on some areas or others? Just a question. The other question I have is um, the challenge we've had with advisors. The president has several advisors on the side. The deputy president has several advisors on the side, and yet the key uh, purpose of cabinet is to have the president well advised. Um, when they do so, are they saying there's a limitations? There's a limitation on the cabinet side that they're not getting the best advice ever from cabinet, that they need to keep some on the side. And then the third one and uh, you can feel free to answer this one. It's a bit more intrusive. Do you get the feeling that cabinet members have freedom of expression within cabinet? So for instance, if the president came and said, um, we want to fund universities this way, are they free to say no? Thank you. Good afternoon, Arnold Magina is my name, and for me I have two questions. The first question goes to words, uh, the talk over uh, your role as a cabinet. You made it clear that yours is to implement the manifesto of the government of the day. My question is this, what if that manifesto when it was being voted upon, people had not internalized it well to understand it. And now there's a shift, or that's no longer tenable to the public. Do just continue implementing it just because it is what has been voted upon. My second, in line with that, what happened to the Vision 2030, which had uh, strategic plans on implementation? Does it stop? Does the cabinet have any mandate in implementation of the Vision 2030 plan or it now that you are under the manifesto implementation, you just focus on that? Then my last question comes to the, it applies to the person we call the head of human resources in government of Kenya. That's our- Recording right, stopped. The right honorable Raila Odinga. So we prefer him as the head of human resource. What role does he play 
in implementation of cabinet policies. Thank you. Um, online, Anne? So we have like seven questions. Guide me and pick two. Okay, um, Anonymous asks, could you kindly elaborate on what happens during the oath of secrecy and at what circumstances are strangers allowed to attend cabinet meetings, taking into account the constitutional composition of the cabinet? That's one question. The next one would be from Marion B., alumnus of Carbrook Law School, currently at KSL. And she says her first question is similar to Mr. Nguri's. Do you think the nature of democracy defeats the sustenance of policies from one regime to another? And therefore, how is transition managed to ensure beneficial policies and programs are not lost or stalled during transitions? Perhaps I finish my own B's question? Yes, you can. The second part of my question. Yes. yes. Okay. Lastly, uh, she says this may be a bit personal. How do you handle. I think I'll just finish. If it had already been responded to, uh, we'll bypass it. Okay. Lastly, this may be a bit personal. How do you handle the political pressure that comes to the job? As a leader myself, I grapple so much with this challenge where everyone wants different things and sometimes it's a bit difficult to communicate the mind of the cabinet stroke leadership to everyone. This question is largely premised on the fact that the government naturally has very few people reporting good things about them. Thank you. And one simple last question from, if I may, <laughs> with your permission. Uh, what does a typical day in your office look like for you? I thought that's a good to, no. Oh, so the first question was on the the broadcasted cabinet. I think that, yeah, the first question from the second session, um, <clears throat> where you were asking, you've seen televised uh, parliamentary sessions, televised uh, events of uh, public interest, are we going to get to the place of a broadcasted cabinet? Um, by its very nature, and uh, given the kind of uh, content that is discussed, is highly confidential. But you've seen efforts to announce it every time when the sessions sit. There is at least a, a picture gram showing that cabinet sat, and then uh, a reflection of uh, the summary of the discussions um, that were made. I suspect that's how far it will go. And I'll tell you why. Remember in my presentation, I said, this is a place where cabinet secretaries come to meet, consider, debate issues, and advise the head of state um, on certain policy discussions. Obviously, just by the nature of that function, it would be inappropriate to then broadcast that John said this, Massey said this, Mary disagreed, so and so stormed out of the room. You know, I can imagine that, you know, that should be within the confines of the room so as to safeguard <coughs> and uphold the sanctity of those discussions. But the beauty is that even in digesting those conversations and sharing them out to the public is a high level of accountability. It doesn't happen in many places, guys. It doesn't. And this is why I encourage you to follow that you may see, that you may know, because that's the space in which you'll be growing into and growing the space um, as well. Then the issue of advisors, uh, are, is the existence of advisors a sign of a gap that's being filled or how should it be addressed? Um, one of the features of a presidential system is actually existence of advisors. And uh, if you look at the American system, uh, looking at it as perhaps the more mature of the presidential systems, it's replete with advisors of all manner, very, very many advisors. I've been an advisor at some point in my life, and um, I see the space of an, of an advisor 
as a space to allow for expansionist thinking but it doesn't compel you to pick that guidance because when an advisor gives a perspective and shares of options you can take the advice you can decline it all you can modify it you can also store it at the back of your mind to use at another time nothing compels you to pick it up it is not the demonstration of a gap because what i have seen over the years is that even with the best of propositions put it to a group of people to discuss you will hear something that you hadn't heard of before so i'd look at it as a space of humility and a space to be embraced with a view to evaluating and picking that which you feel is the most progressive of the sum of ideas that have come to you then uh on cabinet do they have the freedom of expression um can they speak to the issues as they are um when a cabinet secretary takes the oath uh one of the statements is that they will be they will work consensually they will advise i i, I may use different words but it's something like uh, i will advise within the full knowledge and expertise of an issue and to that extent i would say yes a cabinet secretary has freedom of expression especially when it relates to government policy and in particular perhaps to the policy which they have been uh, allocated to handle the next question you will ask me then do they have freedom of expression on all other matters uh, any officer at that level has no personal view no and has no jokes and has you know really anything they say is taken very very seriously and i think it places them in a space then to consider to consideratively examine issues evaluate them very robustly and share them in alignment with the priorities that they subscribe to i don't know if i'm sounding like a bureaucrat or what i don't know but uh, i hope uh, i'm really coming through to say that anything that a cabinet secretary shares must be treated with the seriousness that it it deserves then the next question around the that i spoke about the manifesto what is the place of the vision 2030 and the like maybe i should clarify what i meant is government has its routine enduring business for example vaccinations will happen from administration to administration isn't it that will happen whether you like it or not however every government of the day comes in with a certain promise that's the manifesto and that's what captures the priorities this is not to say that you ignore all others and all you serve is the manifesto no 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 there are a whole lot of body of policies and legislation that govern the framework the legal and policy framework of the republic of kenya then there are those policy priorities like remember i mentioned like the hasla fund the shishaf the issue of the university funding model affordable housing those are priorities of this administration then there is vision 2030 which is the long term far looking vision on the kenya that we want to have that vision 2030 was sliced up into five big slices called medium term plans and actually just last year the mtp4 the fourth tranche was actually passed and launched last year so actually one of the conversations we've been ha having is are we now going maybe in five years to think of a new vision um so that where vision 2030 will end you will have in place considered a new other vision that will anchor because we all drink from vision 2030 through m m m mtps mtps medium term plans and currently running is the mtp4 which will be the last within the vision 2030 so i think it remains to be seen what the planning space will look like in terms of opening up uh, the space so i don't ignore the enduring policies the policies are there to stay some of the policies are very old and we continue to use them as they apply and the mtp mtps also matter now mtp 
is the medium term plan at the national level. At the county level, you have the CIDP, the county integrated development plans, and the two are very complementary as far as uh, delivery is concerned. Then uh, the issue of attendance of strangers to cabinet. I think this is an interesting question because I know we've had this uh, issue before in the last administration with John Buddy. No, not John Buddy, General Buddy, the Nairobi Metropolitan something he used to attend cabinet and there was litigation out of it we also had it in the fifth administration when advisors uh, attended and is a subject of uh, litigation now we are moving from a westminster type of uh, governance to a presidential system and i think you even mentioned that maybe it has happened very slowly um, i am inclined to say we are still in the process of developing. If we are still in the process of developing, how are we going to test this thing? I invite you to look at uh, the American system and look at just the sheer amount of people who attend cabinet. Do they attend because the secretaries of those portfolios have gaps? I don't think so. I think it's to bring the best of the capability. How are we going to test what this means? So that at some point we will say, we are now fairly advanced in implementing or we are moving very slowly or we have arrived wherever it is that uh, we were arriving i think we're in a stage of evolution and uh, we remain to see what that um, will look like i think it remains to be seen then uh, the issue of democracy does democracy stifle policies from past administrations i think i've answered this past administrations, past policies, those policies, so, so long as they remain on our books, as policies and pieces of legislation are enduring. So you can't ignore them. So you, and that goes into the routine implementation of government business, even as you focus on pushing your priorities. Remember, your priorities are new. They're new. So they're the new kids on the block, so to speak. So you focus on those because you need to pass them. Without them, you're not going to achieve your, your priorities, but they both, they both must carry on. Then handling pressure. How do I handle pressure and the politics that come with it and what does a typical day look like? I think uh, one of the things I would say, um, in these public roles, one of my uh, former bosses when I practiced law said, you must always learn to be dispassionate. What does dispassionate mean? Dispassionate means feel so strongly about an issue, but know enough to separate yourself from the issue. I think it's important uh, to do that, even, even just for mental health, if, if nothing else. It's important so that it leaves you the space to speak as well as you can, as strongly as you can to an issue, but not lose yourself in the process of handling that matter. I'm happy that I'm a Kenyan because I think the kind of space that exists for Kenyans to express themselves, guys, you know it doesn't happen in many places. But also perhaps we also go into it with blue energy, with so much energy that it sort of seems to forget there are people on the other side who are handling this issue. But uh, be that as it may, it's the space that we have and it's a space of character development, and uh, it's one that we have to agree to push forward always with critical conversations, difficult conversations, but constructive conversations. It's car it becomes character development, I believe, for all of us. So my typical day, I don't think I have any one day that looks like the other. So today I'm here. Next week, you probably find us um, in cabinet. The next day, you're probably going to parliament or engaged in meetings through and through. But uh, suffice to say, sometimes it can be very long hours. But uh, I always believe, always try and seek out a balance. You stretch yourself to achieve something, then rebalance to regain uh, some kind of uh, composure as you then uh, refresh for the next day. Please, standing ovation for this
Secretary to the Cabinet. Another round of applause. Thank you so much. The time is much spent. Um, just to buttress um, in what uh, the Secretary to the Cabinet has said, um, you'll find that there are two principles in Cabinet, I believe, which is the principles of collegiality and collectivism. Um, when the Dean was asking about freedom of expression, um, it made me think about those terms that you have an inward looking principle, which is the principle of collegiality, that within yourselves, each one of you has capacity to push certain positions within, your, within within policy, to take certain policy positions. But once you come out of that cabinet meeting, there is also the principle of collectivism, that once you come out, you do, your freedom of expression has essentially ended. You have to speak in one voice as one government, and you cannot embarrass the president at whose pleasure you work. Uh, because if you exercise your freedom too much, uh, you shall soon find yourself home. So it's an interesting balance in terms of how uh, cabinets work, and I think that your exposition of the same has been extremely enlightening. I'm hoping it's been the same for all of you. Okay, so um, to help us properly exercise our, our thanks, we shall invite the president of the Kabarak Law Students Association, uh, this is Ms. Adeline Chalagat, uh, to come and to give a vote of thanks on our behalf. When you said, when you came here, you felt a certain type of tension. I can feel it myself. <laughs> Otherwise, um, Chief Guest, Ms. Marcy Wanjao, our dear Dean, Professor Jonas Ogwambani, our Associate Dean, uh, Ms. Wakuraya, our members of faculty who are present today, our student body, our virtual participants, Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon once again. I don't know if you all feel the much gratitude in your hearts as I feel today uh, to be able to just sit here and witness this occasion in history. I mean, it's monumental in of itself. So just to introduce myself once again, my name is Adeline Chelagat Kipto. I'm currently the serving president of Kabarak University Law Students Association, KULSA. I had my cabinet, so I was, I was taking notes. <laughs> I was taking notes. Oh, it's Rita. Rita is our secretary. I hope she's also taking notes. So that was really fantastic. Uh, but before I go to move that vote of thanks, something that always speaks to me in terms of mentorship, I want to use the allegory of the cave as Plato talks about it. And so he imagines that there is a cave and we have prisoners in this cave who are stuck for such a long time. And there's a bright light behind them and it illuminates images against the wall. And so what the prisoners know is what is illuminated in that wall, right? So we have a vase. They'll only see the vase as seen in the wall. Anything, these beautiful flowers, our torn are black, pekeakem. And so Plato says that one time these people escape from that cave and they go to the world and they're like, oh my God, we can have pink flowers. And these flowers are really beautiful. We can have pink flowers. We can have, right? The soil can be brown, it's not. And so he says that it is the duty of these escaped prisoners to come back and to teach the prisoners still stuck in the cave of what the outside world has to offer right? That you guys, we can actually have yellow flowers. Not every time it's color, color black. And this speaks to what has happened today, right? So you being our escaped prisoner, you have, <laughs> you have gone outside to the world, you have seen what it has to offer. I mean, yesterday I was looking at the um, your profile together with your interview. I was just like, oh my God, 
oh my god such a person is actually coming to Kabarak Law School to, to talk to us students I was very much impressed and very much humbled so I want to say thank you so much for coming back to this cave for teaching us what is possible right you have actually seen that how a cabinet runs I mean Never in all my years could I think that that was possible. So thank you so much. We are very humbled, not just as a student body, I'm sure from the faculty and from the university. I also want to thank the um, people who have made this possible. So starting from the university, we receive a lot of support from the vice chancellor. So vice chancellor, wherever you are, we want to thank you deeply. I also want to thank the faculty, so from our dean, you know, to give us these opportunities, to believe in us, to give us such chances. I don't think this happens in any other university. So Asante Sanadine, together with the members of faculty from Mr. Nguri, who has done a fantastic job in moderating the session, to, yes, I'm beginning, Mr. Nguri Makofi. Yes, thank you, too to Miss Melissa, Mr. Arnold, the type of questions that they've asked. So thank you so much. So thank you so much. I'd also want to thank the people who have made this possible uh, from you here, uh, Ms. Priska. And then we also have the media team from Stanley Crystal. You've seen Kenaya running around with the microphone, uh, Pereso. So, so many people have actually done a lot of work to have this event come to fruition and we thank you wherever you are. And lastly, to thank the most important people in this room, the leaders of tomorrow, the vision bearers of this country the students who are seated here. Can we just give ourselves a round of applause, please? Mm. Mm. It actually, as I always say, it takes a lot to just show up, to sit down, to listen, take notes, ask questions, think about the things that are being discussed here. And I want to thank you so much for just showing up, for the concentration that you've given. I know it's past lunchtime for the type of questions that you've asked and to also thank our virtual participants. I've seen them from all over the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us wherever you are. And that technically sums up the vote of thanks. Otherwise, I really hope that as students, you have been inspired. Personally, I never thought that, you know, I could re rethink a career to work maybe as a cabinet secretary, to work as a secretary in the cabinet, right? So I think this has given, you know, this is actually possible. And as my parting shot, I would like to say, ladies and gentlemen, elevate highly. We do what? We do what? Fantastic. So elevate highly even as you go back to your places. <laughs> Thank you so much.